Welcome to the Lutheran History Podcast, where we cover over 500 years of Lutheran history. We hear new stories, examine old heroes of faith, and dig into the who, how, what, and why of history making. So whether you are Lutheran seeking to understand your faith's rich roots, a history lover, or a person looking for stories of trials, tragedies, or triumphs, you'll find what you're looking for right here. Today's guest is Isaac Johnson, is a graduate of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, the degree in Latin. He got that back in 2011. Then he attended Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. And during his time at the seminary, he spent two years studying at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Oberursel, Germany, the Evangelische Lutherische Hochschule. He was ordained in 2016, where he was called then to serve at Risen Christ Lutheran Church in Davenport, Iowa. He now serves New Hope Lutheran Church, a mission congregation in Charles City, Iowa. Isaac has a strong interest in homiletics and the German language. He is currently engaged in translating Reinhold Pieper's homiletics textbook, which is something we talked about on one of our previous podcast episodes. So, Isaac, thank you for joining us today, uh, Pastor Johnson. Um, first question for you is, how did you get started on this topic? Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, I suppose I've been started on this, uh, or I've been engaged with this topic most of my life because I grew up with a very strong law gospel cross-centered preaching for which I'm extremely grateful. Uh, and that without a doubt had the most uh, profound inf- impact on shaping my own preaching. Uh, but over the last few years, there have been some articles that have been written, say, uh, two articles by Dr. Adam Kuntz, uh, another one by Dr. Ben Mays uh, before that, and then several years before Dr. Mays, I believe it was 2010, uh, Dr. David Schmidt of St. Louis wrote an article as well, which said, uh, it, and this is very broadly and generally speaking, kind of criticized a formulaic law gospel kind of rut that we've fallen into. And uh, in the paper that we're discussing today, I kind of dissect uh, some of that problem as well. But as you can imagine, that really hit home for me, right? Because like my whole life, I've been trained to look at a text and say, where's where's the cross? And again, that's a wonderful thing to do. Um, and, and then to say, uh, and then to say, how, what is the law in this text and what is the gospel in this text? And that provides all the material for a sermon. And uh, here are some guys who are saying, well, maybe there's a, a different way to do it. Um, and so I read, I read those articles. It felt like to me the beginning of the conversation, uh, this relationship between, say, law gospel preaching and what some others suggested as an, al- an alternative, which would be, say, the fivefold use uh, preaching which historically is how Lutherans uh, preached, at least before, say, 1940. Um, and, uh, you know, comes from 2 Timothy 3 and Romans chapter 5, uh, referring to the, the teaching, right? All scripture is um, useful for uh, teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, and consoling or comforting. Uh, so I basically uh, got started on the topic by my own experience and said, okay, I need to figure out exactly what's going on here so that I can continue preaching. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, you and I come from different Lutheran backgrounds. You are part of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and I am Mm -hmm. part of the Wisconsin Synod. But historically, and we talked about this, it seems like every other episode, um, you know, that was all part of that historical uh, synodical conference. And Mm -hmm. that I would say the the preaching mindset, the preaching heritage, is something that I would I would agree that from my perspective too it was where's that law gospel in, in each and every single text that seems to be something that although our mm-hmm. sins have gone separate ways uh, mm-hmm. sixty plus years ago now that is something that continued it, its own thread and both from my my kind of personal uh, perspective but also kind of a historical uh, reckoning too which is also interesting because prior to that both of our, our synods had some pretty strong Pieper influences. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, Fr- Francis Franz Pieper was, uh, well, they were all in the Wisconsin Synod originally, 
Uh, but Franz Francis mm -hmm. Pieper wrote the famous dogmatics text and, of course, was president of the Concordia Seminary for a while. Um, and now you're looking at Reinhold Pieper's homiletics book. Well, uh, August Pieper was a professor at um, our seminary. So that, there's kind of that common heritage, but it's interesting, both a before and an after. Um, so you explain why, how you got on this topic, because it was relevant to you and how you viewed preaching. And, you know, just reflecting what I've seen, it did kind of seem like there's only one right way to approach a text, only one right way to generally formulate a sermon. But that has been yeah. challenged now, just thinking about homiletics in general. But now we, looking at the historical angle, realize there's a, a different historical perspective um, that also filters, oh, is that really the only cookie cut? And I would say cookie cutter because that, or stencil mm -hmm. as you might use, right. but a very particular yep. way uh, to do something. So um, I guess my question is, now we tie this together, and if you want to add anything uh, on top of that, but what value is there for contemporary Lutherans in becoming familiar with, say, for example, Reinhold Pieper's preaching theology? Well, Reinhold Pieper is of primary use and importance for contemporary Lutheran preaching uh, because of how he goes about the task of uh, training preachers in homiletics uh, in his textbook. Uh, and uh, he specifically um, doesn't just create something new, but he is extremely well-read and I would say fluent uh, by the way that he uses it. And in the, the corpus of homiletical teachings from especially in Lutheran uh, in Luth the history of Lutheranism, but then going back, of course, to the ancient church fathers, uh, of Luther, the ancient church fathers, and then back to biblical preaching. Um, if you read his textbook, what you'll find is that about, uh, this is just a, a spitball number, but uh, say 50% of the book is him quoting other people, and uh, at least 50%, maybe up to 65 or more percent. And then the rest of it would be his own additions. Uh, so what does uh, Reinhold Pieper represent? He represents a synthesis of Lutheran teaching on preaching for especially the, the past several centuries, say from the um, 16th century through uh, the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, including, you know, a, a rich tradition of preaching before that. Um, and the re reason why Pieper is of particular importance uh, is because all, I mean, I did not even know he existed two years ago. And I did not know that the people of the people he quoted, right? He talks about a man named Hufo. He talks about Grotefend. He talks about Schott. He talks about Harms. And I mean, maybe I had heard one or two of those names before, but I had no idea that they wrote these extensive books and textbooks on preaching. And uh, uh, Reinhold Pieper, and of course, J.J. Rombach is like the main one, uh, his homiletical teachings. Um, he, he takes all of that, just read it very thoroughly, synthesizes it, and just presents it to the American Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, not in the sense of the, uh, the, the church body, but the... Uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of um, uh, that is in this country. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there's so many acronyms you have to watch out. You might actually talk about a, a real group, but yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> so he's providing, you know, just to kind of uh, speak back to what you've been telling telling me and, and, and see if I get it right. But he's basically providing this treasure trove of this is our Lutheran historical yes. uh, preaching tradition from the past 400 years. Let me summarize it for you. Let me boil it down to the to the gems. But you know, he's not really reducing it that much. It's still a pretty substantial work mm -hmm. um, by today's standards. I think an editor would would pull his hair out looking at. Wow, it's a lot of quotes. You, it's kind of tough to read. Just a lot of other people. Right. Um, but as a resource, you know, he was already being a historian of preaching in a certain sense. He had it was a practical theology book, um, but they saw practical theology and uh, historical theology all rolled into one. I think I lost you there for a second, but I think you're back, huh? All right. Yeah. I can hear uh, you. 
Good. Um, so I, I basically said, though, he rolled uh, practical theology into historical theology. Um, and, and and maybe that's kind of lost. Maybe we try to divide that a lot today. Is it practical or is it historical? Um, but really, it's all interconnected in my point of view. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, Pieper very heavily emphasized the uh, um, he heavily emphasized the, the practical the practical nature of the of the theology, right? Yeah. So what we're talking about today is kind of two projects of yours. Uh, the big one um, is the translation of this homiletics textbook. So you are uh, intimately familiar with it. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, what what stage are you at um, in translating this text? Uh, but I'm down to the last, I don't know, 50 pages or so. So I have about two chapters left. Um, after that, um, I'm working with uh, excellent translator, Matthew Carver. He's giving me, uh, showing me the ropes and really helping me to, to improve what I'm doing. Um, then it'll probably be a, a, at least a year of going back and re-editing and everything. And I'm working with CPH right now and they haven't, we don't have anything official going right now, but um, I hope that uh, comes to pass. If not, I'll definitely be working with uh, another publisher. Um, but yeah, so I would say, um, yeah, at least another year. Okay. Before it's done. Yeah. But that, that would be a uh, rather, rather important volume to add to any Lutheran pastors uh, library, in my opinion. So I'm, I'm Eager to oh, hear without about. a doubt. Yeah. Um, and actually, I was uh, when I was looking for you know professors to endorse this translation when I was submitting to CPH. Uh, Dr. Kuhn said something that struck me as fully true. That Pieper's homiletics textbook is as essential for Lutheran homiletics as Francis Pieper's dogmatics is to systematics. Yeah. And that's and for those for those in our audience uh, who maybe don't know that, but um, like I was saying earlier, Pieper's dogmatics texts are still, although it's about a hundred years old, um, and the translation's been out for I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years now. It's still considered uh, pretty much a record. You should at least have looked at mm -hmm. it seriously, if not had it taught as the classroom textbook on dog, dogmatics. Right? There are others that have come out more recently, more resources, but the theology shouldn't have changed from uh, Francis Pieper's yeah, uh, dogmatics, right? So yeah, it's kind of a, a gold standard. So that's a, that's a pretty major statement to say that Reinhold Pieper's book um, on homiletics should be right up there uh, with his brothers. Um, and now that's a, there's, a, there's another statement built into that, that you haven't, you didn't hear about it until two years ago, um, as mm -hmm. I think that's what you said, right? And I didn't hear about Correct. it until a few months ago, probably. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little litmus test of how many people are really familiar with it. And, and part right. of this is the tragedy. Well, maybe tragedy is too strong of a word, but um, the huge challenge that happened when the language shift took place from German to English. And that's why this translation work is so valuable. If this book is really that important, uh, it's well worth a person's time like, like yours to translate and make it available to uh, the original audience the Evangelical Lutheran Church uh, located in America. I think that's not, not, that's <laughs> that not a synod, located. right? I'm yeah. sure there's an acronym. That's like that. There might be one out there, yeah. Um, no, I mean, we were, to my understanding, afraid that the transition from German to English would be a catastrophe. And uh, although I don't regret that we're speaking in, in English right now, there are some respects in which it actually was a catastrophe in the sense that much of our heritage uh, just stayed on the shelf and became, not only did students uh, have the, 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 the hindrance of needing to take up the book and read it, which is sometimes too much for us in our, in our weak flesh, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's also in a German a language they don't understand. So it becomes almost entirely inaccessible to almost everybody. Uh, now, the effect that that has is uh, we have all the same theological needs. And so if we can grasp back into our theological history, we go elsewhere. 
And so you see a profound, profound influence in Lutheran homiletics coming from the English tradition uh, in America. Yeah. So, and that's, that's a whole nother can of worms. You know, you get the, not probably not so much like an Anglican influence, but definitely more of a, a Calvinist or a, a evangelical, so to speak, American evangelicalism. And, and that's something that yes. others have pointed out. Um, you know, I always say, and I keep on saying it more, you are what you eat, right? And if you're only consuming mm -hmm. uh, non-Lutheran material, yeah, can they have something to offer? Absolutely. But is the main substance or, and now as you study theology more deeply, um, their theological presuppositions are built into how they view everything. And that's how they're going to preach exactly. with those uh, assumptions that are often in error, uh, that are not scriptural. Um, so yeah, it, it has affected the, the culture um, in American Lutheranism, whether you claim to be a strenuous confessional or not. If you're not reading the Lutheran material, you're going to lose base or lose touch with some of that. And the danger, of course, is that the theological presuppositions underlying their applications are not always immediately apparent. Mm -hmm. So you say, oh, that's a useful thing. That, that sounds good. I'll do that without premeditating on, you know, the theological underlying supposition. When, so you end up doing something when, in fact, if you, one had considered it uh, all, you know, previously, they wouldn't have done it. Right. It's almost, you know, what, what, not so much, is there anything wrong with what is being said, um, but are we miss, are we losing out on something? What, what isn't being said? And I think that's maybe kind of the issue here with the, mm -hmm. the stencil of, of law gospel, mm -hmm. how it's been assumed. And for those of you, if you, if you are kind of wondering what we're talking about, there's a previous episode on has Lutheran preaching changed? And we talked about related issues you may want to listen to, but yeah. Um, and it is the way that the cookie cutter stencil law gospel preaching, which in your paper, you said sometimes it's, it's a bit of a stereotype too, the way people uh, go after mm -hmm. it. But yeah. it seems to me, in my opinion, this is just my opinion. It seems to be geared towards uh, evoking almost always an emotional response out of the audience. Make you feel bad, it will make you feel good. Make you feel bad with the law, make you feel good with the gospel. And as we're saying, this is kind of being influenced by broader American evangelical Christianity. That kind of harkens back to the Second Great Awakening, where it was, we're preaching mm -hmm. to get an emotional response to get you to um, embrace Christianity in a, in a specific way based on an emotion. Um, we've given you um not that emotions are always wrong or bad but right I, historically i can kind of trace that that line of thinking and maybe that's fair maybe that's not that would require more yeah. study well i think it's you know it really comes down to a balance of those things um if you go back to aristotle's rhetoric of course he has these three parts to to rhetoric which i think are is to my my experience or in my opinion is a faithful representation of the way god has created speech that there's a logos, an ethos, and a pathos, uh, meaning that there's a logos, a logical ar argument to what's being said. There's a pathos, there's an emotional argument that's being made. And then there's the ethos, which is uh, somewhat different than the first two, but just as necessary, which is that the speaker needs to have credibility, right? The credibility um, of the speaker. Uh, and so when you get an overemphasis in any of these respects, you end up with problems, right? If you have an overemphasis on the ethos, then you get a cult of personality. If you, uh, so, and what I mean is like, if it's all about this person's credibility, right? If that's the only reason you believe it, then you end up with an authoritarian society. Um, and here I'm just talking about worldly rhetoric, um, but yeah. I think the same applies then to spiritual rhetoric, because then you get these um, churches that are entirely built on charismatic creatures as opposed right. to Christ. Um, but then you get it. If you get an overemphasis in the, uh, an overemphasis, I, I You're speaking too much Greek, I, Greek yeah. of, I Greekified it. Yeah. Uh, and an overemphasis uh, in the pathos, then you get, you know, say like great awakening types preaching, perhaps the, um, the, you could identify law gospel preaching as uh, more geared at the, at the emotions. So if you get an overemphasis, <laughs> if you get an overemphasis in the pathos, then you get something like the the Great Awakening, where it's all about evoking emotion in the individual. But there's also a problem if you overemphasize the logos, and this is 
what, what you get with some of the critics of classical Lutheran preaching is that it was overly didactic in the sense that you go to church and it is that the preacher presents a thesis with proving arguments in order to persuade you to intellectually accept the theological argument that they're making. Um, now, if that's that's OK, right, and it needs to be done. Um, but if it's overwrought or overemphasized, um, what uh, Defner said this, and I think Schmidt also said it, is that it becomes like lethally dull, right? So there needs to be there needs to be a balance uh, in the in these three aspects. Um, now, granted, I'm talking about a pagan when I refer to Aristotle, um, but I think that it does shed quite a bit of light on the the movement that preaching and homiletics has taken, because in the end, you know, uh, this, uh, the way that we speak and the way that people listen, although um, in many ways corrupted by sin, is the way, something that God has created, right? And he's a God of order. He created it to work in, in a certain way. So just as music, uh, that there are pleasant harmonies and there are discordant harmonies, uh, so also there's a uh, speech with, which is harmonious with the listener and speech which is discordant with the listener, speech which communicates well, speech which doesn't communicate well. So I think it's a balance between those three aspects that has been, uh, that has kind of went heavily from the didactic be pre-1950s and 60s, and then went pretty heavily into the experiential or the, the, the pathos argument um, from there leading to today. Yeah, and historians like to often use that that pendulum of a clock to illustrate kind of shifts over time like well maybe the pendulum was way too far in the 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 logical <laughs> reasoning we're just going to lay out the facts and here's why um and now go to the other now of course yep. you're always going to find exceptions to those those um generalizations but yeah i think Correct. generalizations are also useful because they are generally true or generally reflect yeah. what was was reality yeah interesting so yeah this is this is really hard to divide this from just to be purely a historical discussion because it is talking about um in a way how things are today and maybe how how they affect people in the present right um but of course we gain so much from looking at the history of the past too um where would we be if we had no perception of what it used to be like before the year 1950 right that would be kind of a yeah absolutely would be pretty aimlessly wandering i would think so yeah again this is really a valuable um project here so let's get into a little bit more of the the content then of well we talked about peeper and, and explained how things were different back then uh yeah. but what was his definition of preaching yeah peeper's definition of preaching was um something that i had never heard or at least i had never heard it put that way before um he defines it as spiritual eloquence, okay, or spiritual oratory, or spiritual rhetoric. You could translate it that way as well. Uh, and in so doing, he actually does connect it to the classical tradition in rhetoric, originating with Aristotle, maturing, I would dare say, with Quintilian, uh, and then continuing on uh, with, and also with Cicero, of course, uh, and then on from there. So, um, yeah, he, but he calls it specifically spiritual rhetoric. Um, and the way that he defines that is basically it's, it's a capacity for talking about things in the scripture well, speaking about them well, uh, for two reasons. One is to lead the listeners to the knowledge of and adoption of the truth. So it's not just intellectual, but it is, um, it's not just, I believe this truth, but I adopt this truth, right? I act out this truth. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then it has the second goal, of course, of leading the listeners to salvation. So with that definition of preaching, how did he view, uh, well, the task of the preacher, how is he supposed to connect his sermon with the biblical text? There's a an assigned text right the reading for that sunday is generally uh, he had two or, or three options right but how was the pastor meant to interact with that right uh so how is the preacher to interact with the, the biblical text and how is he to look at it uh this is some something that absolute this is how i should say peeper 
completely grasped my grasped my heart and got my attention uh, and really began to persuade me uh, because he speaks so uh, emphatically and convincingly of the primacy of the biblical text. That is basically, t- take that spirit and lay it throughout all of his homiletics textbook uh, and, and, and apply the whole enterprise of, of homiletics and preaching, uh, preaching to sinners. And, uh, and that's what Pieper's homiletics textbook is. Uh, when he so practically applied then, um, how do you use the text or how are you to view it first? Well, he says that um, it is that which legitimizes the preacher before his hearers. It is the, the, the fact that he's preaching on the biblical text uh, is the only thing that makes this a spiritual rhetoric and not just merely a worldly speech. So the primacy of the the biblical text is that it must be the foundation. But then he goes beyond that. And I think this is of first importance in our conversation now, is that he says, granted, he says as much as possible is to be taken from the text, not as the um, as building material for the sermon. So it's not just the foundation, but the biblical text is also the, the building material for the construction of the sermon. Uh, so in terms of how one is to, um, and then perhaps we should talk about the function, uh, the function of the biblical text as well. Um, basically, uh, he says that um, the biblical text provides three things to the preacher. First, it provides his material. Um, it, secondly, it leads him deeper and deeper into the scriptures. So there's a meditative devotional aspect to it. Uh, and finally, it restricts the pastor, the preacher, which again is of first importance for the conversation of how, how is to one go about preaching a text, one of the primary, and how, and how is a preacher to look, regard his text. The way that Pieper talks about it in one chapter is that the, the text is to put up the boundaries for a preacher and he is to move within those boundaries and not to step over those boundaries. And his belief is that if you step over the boundaries that a text puts for you, then he calls it human invention. Because how else does the, do the people know that the word that you're speaking as a preacher is the divine word, unless it is based on and constructed out of the biblical text. Now, of course, there's uh, all sorts of ways to unravel that and unfold it in the application of building a sermon. But I think it's a profound statement. Yeah, it, it, there's a kind of a, a restrict, uh, kind of, there is a certain restriction that he's giving. Um, you're restricted to this text in some way. Um, yeah, so I guess a, a question I have then, it, does that mean, let's say, well, I don't want to have you like write a sermon for me, but um, a couple <laughs> weeks ago, we are, I already preached on this, the, the woman at the, the Samaritan woman at the well, for example, would, uh-huh. would, would Pieper say you have that text and now it's forming the, the whole sermon in a certain way, does even like the, the order of the sermon, it should kind of follow the order of that conversation Jesus had uh, with the woman. I'm kind of wondering now, how would I practically apply that? Um, is that, is that as narrow as he wants it to be, or simply only the th- theological themes brought up in that text are the ones you should be addressing it's more the latter okay. he uh in, he incorporates basically two kinds two general categories of sermon construction one is what he calls analytical and another is what he calls uh synthetic and then there's a third actually that's analytical synthetic but he kind of just throws a paragraph after and says eh you know just use the first two right <laughs> that's a paraphrase uh but analytical is basically uh your theme in your sermon is based on your text and your sermon has the same goal that the text has. It's trying to do the same thing that the text is trying to do. Okay, so let's take, for example, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, You're trying to uh, 
comfort the, the poor in spirit. We are trying to comfort those hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Um, that would be, and then you go through all of that. And then in the analytical sermon, it often does take the form of saying, okay, the first part talks about this, the second talk, part talks about this. Um, but it's not even necessarily chronological. It can be structured, restructured somewhat. Um, but Pieper does say that one should take into careful consideration the the ordering that the Holy Spirit gave to this topic in the biblical text, and not to regard that lightly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, and and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. I had previously thought about asking you about. Uh, how does the text's context allow appropriate flexibility, mm -hmm. right? So now he's it's restrictive, but then he does say there's there's area for flexibility. So it's, where does that all balance? How does that all fit in? Yeah, so that actually would kind of lead into his second uh, format. So the first is analytical, where it's based on the text and it has the same goal as the text. Uh, but then he defines the synthetic sermon as one that is based on the text and is included in the text, but is doesn't your sermon doesn't necessarily have the same goal that the text has yeah so for example take like the uh, the, the healing of the official son i believe i read a walther sermon where he makes the argument and the point of the sermon is to say that also in heterodox churches there are true believers the fact that this gentile official had more more faith than anyone in israel right uh shows this truth uh so it is based on the text and it's restricted to the text in the sense that it is directly there um he's not necessarily talking about the resurrection for the dead uh, from the dead for example um it is specifically there but it's not necessarily what jesus is trying to what that narrative or what the evangelist is trying to do with that text now i he says you can do it in both ways and I think this is an area where more research and development uh, needs to be um, invested. Uh, but uh, I've, I have uh, Reinhold Pieper's apostle uh, for the, the gospel texts for the historic lectionary. Uh, and he implies exclusively the analytical method. Because I think for him, now with Walther, you get the synthetic a whole lot, at least in the gospel apostles mm -hmm. that were recently published uh, by CPH. You get, uh, very often you get the synthetic uh, where he's just make, taking a, a part out of the text that is in the text and then just kind of elaborating on that, on that divine truth. Uh, but Reinhold Pieper, and perhaps this is more of his unique contribution, at least within Lutheranism, is very concerned with doing what the text is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what his, his preaching reflects, even though he says, yes, you can do a synthetic sermon. And oftentimes a synthetic sermon might be necessary. For example, if you have some kind of false teaching that is rampant in your church and you either choose a text or a text comes up in the lectionary, and yes, Pieper was just fine with free texting. He would rather have us free text than to take a, a lectionary text and try to apply it to something that it doesn't apply to at all. He said, right. just use a different text, right? Um, but using that, uh, using that free text uh, to refute a sp that specific false teaching that's that's in your congregation. So, you know, there's a really important practical application to the synthetic method, although it's in my experience so far, at least that Reinhold Pieper truly favored the analytical technique. And I find myself agreeing with that notion. Yeah, it definitely has the pros of, you know, this is trying to be a lot more authentic um, versus I have already pre-concluded what I want to, I want to say as a preacher. The mm -hmm. analytic is, well, what is God really trying to say? And I'm just the, yeah. the messenger. And I can see how that would be appealing. Precisely. But, you know, he does have that appropriate flexibility, though, of mm -hmm. um, the audience is part of it, right? It's not that the word is is living and active, directed at people, and, and therefore it would need to, to do that. So can we talk about how did he regard the, the audience in the role of the formation of the sermon? Because I think that example of he would take a text to preach to a specific need means he's obviously considering the audience in, in some way in the preparation oh, absolutely. of the sermon. And although, yeah, absolutely. And although he would, I mean, he puts all the emphasis on the biblical text 
uh, he says that, you know, you can't have a sermon without application. Application is just uh, just as essential as the interpretation, right? So you get these two parts, interpretation, application. And to be frank, if Peeper falls into some kind of stencil, if we want to use that word, or a cookie cutter, it's kind of the interpretation application stencil, uh, mm -hmm. which I think that there are worse ones. But um, yeah, so he... Uh, incorporates uh, so much flexibility, uh, specifically. And I'm sorry, can you uh, rephrase or can you remind me of your question? Oh, just how did uh, Peeper regard or consider the audience in the uh, role right. of of sermon prep or in delivery? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so they're the other essential element, right? You've got God's word, you've got the preacher, you've uh, you've got the congregation. Uh, I've just translated the other day this beautiful passage, uh, very boldly stated where he said, yes, God has given us his word, his, his written word, and his uh, written word is sufficient in and of itself. But he says, but God also instituted the preaching office, right? And without the preaching office, and this is the, the, the living proclamation of that written word to sinners in need of repentance and forgiveness, uh, then, you know, if you didn't have that, the church would not exist, right? So he sees it also as completely foundational that there's this transaction that's occurring between the preacher and the audience uh, and the uh, the the congregation or the listeners are or the hearers are so uh, so important to him that everything that the preacher is doing needs to be geared at faithfully delivering the biblical content to the people right so he demands that uh, it first of all that it be your manuscript be written out uh, so that you can go back and edit it, make sure there's no false teaching, and make sure that it faithfully represents the biblical text. Uh, he also demands that it be memorized verbatim. Yeah. He says, uh, word for word. Uh, and But the goal there is that there's, what he said is that there's, so that there's no partition between the pastor and the congregation, right? So although Peeper, a uh, student of uh, well, Reinhold Pieper, student of Walther, of course, uh, did very much focus on didactic or uh, or, or uh, instruction, uh, instructional teaching or instructive teaching. In no way did he advocate for a kind of preaching with the head down uh, that's really heady and overly logical, not in any way, right? He focused on the preaching, but the idea was that the voice the word choice, the facial expressions, the gestures. He talks about all of these in great detail about how they are all to be used in communicating this divine truth and as a living witness of Jesus Christ to, to the listeners and to the hearers. Yeah, I, I can anticipate a lot of pastors who might be listening to this now suddenly getting really, really eager to see your translation work done because that that's kind of, co it's covering all the aspect. Well, I may be missing something, but it seems like it's covering mm -hmm. every aspect of, of preaching when it, I, he seems to have been uh, the purpose of this this book. Yeah. Yeah, uh, certainly all the fundamental yeah. aspects of preaching. Yeah, and, and so, and I, I don't read a ton of preaching books. I know there are other guys who, maybe that's more of their, their interest and their focus, but sometimes they seem like they're only covering like, one of those aspects of how can you be better at x how can you be better at y um this is a little more comprehensive then for, for sure yeah um, one way i've heard it characterized uh is that recent textbooks have focused very much on form so again one aspect of it without perhaps fully elaborating on the underlying theology and peeper covers all of those bases which I found, again, it just, it felt like it, it gave me a full diet. I felt like I had, at least in terms of uh, homiletics, to some extent, uh, I felt like I had a very, a, a, dilate, a, a diet, a homiletical diet that was isolated to a few, few case uses, say, you know, the application of law and gospel, um, not using a manuscript, things like that, that I was concerned with. Uh, but then as I began to read uh, read Peeper, it really flushed out, flushed that out to be a, a holistic nourishment in terms of uh, homiletics. Yeah, so I guess maybe we could circle back to 
kind of how this all got started. Is it yeah. would it be fair then to say, uh, having now that you are the expert on Reinhold Pieper's homiletics textbook? Oh dear. Um, oh dear. Yeah. You, well, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to to inflate your ego there, but I think that's a fair statement, right? You're you're dealing with it. Um, you know what it says. Uh, how would he respond to? Um, this law gospel preaching kind of as it is understood oh. generally today, would he embrace, yeah, law gospel, that's what you need to do. I would, it seems like maybe no, um, but you, you tell oh, me, that's a, how does yeah, he that's a deal with law gospel? Question. Yeah, sorry, that is a, just a fantastic question. Uh, so I think he would offer one central criticism is repetitiveness. Uh, and so he said that this was also a problem with fivefold use preaching at a time. And he quoted Rombach saying this, that, you know, he said, OK, you got to use the fivefold use. Right. Second Timothy three, Romans 15. But the people uh, at, at that time, at least this is so this is Rombach's time. So we're talking 18th century. Uh, the preachers had taken it as a mortal sin. That's the totus zunda. Right. It was a mortal sin if they failed to use each of the five uses in every single sermon. So see, imagine how formulaic that would be. Okay, mm -hmm. the woman at the well. What is, what am I going to, I'm going to teach my people a little bit. I'm going to refute some heretics. I'm going to do some correcting. I'm going to do some training in righteousness. And we'll end with a, a dash of comfort. And they would do that every single sermon. And they felt like it was a mortal sin mm -hmm. if they didn't do that. And that's something that I mentioned in my paper. It's like, this is exactly how we feel about law gospel preaching, at least sometimes how I feel, is that if mm -hmm. I diverge, I am automatically failing at the preaching task. Uh, and so, other people might say that to you, too. Oh, without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt, yeah. Um, so he, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, can you bring me back to the question again? <laughs> yeah, so I guess I'll rephrase it, maybe keep it simple. What, is, yep. what does paper do with law gospel if he... Wait, oh, is yeah, it fair thanks. to assume he's not going to say you have to stencil law and gospel? That seems totally out of character from what everything you've said. But what does he, what role does he see law and gospel then in his preaching? Yeah. So indeed, I would think that he would uh, be critical of any form of formulaic or repetitive law gospel preaching, which to be fair, uh, I, I haven't seen anybody pro or anti law gospel, however you want to say it, right, who has... Uh, who has ever advocated for formulaic preaching, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, I think that would be his, uh, that would be his criticism. And he was critical of overusing the, uh, doing an overwrought use of, of the fivefold use as well. Um, and that, so that's a good question. How would law and gospel work into the sermon uh, for Reinhold Pieper? I've heard the argument made a few times that law and gospel isn't mentioned all that often in Pieper's homiletics textbook. And that's true. He does not, his premise for the, the textbook and for preaching is at no point said, how does this text convict my sinners? And how does this text point, point the sinners to the cross? Like he's just, at, at no, and it, I mean, of course, that, that works its way in when he talks about the, necessi the necessity of teaching repentance and forgiveness, which comes in a particular part, but he does not systemize it the, the, the way that we might be used to um, in our present context in the Lutheran church. I would say that for Pieper, law and gospel is part of that flexibility in the text. Law and gospel is part of the, the broad context that you need to keep in mind uh, in whenever you're preaching, right? So he basically said, you got to be restricted to the text, but if you preach without the context in mind, you'll probably practice false exegesis and therefore false, you know, that will lead, of course, mm -hmm. to false preaching. So he, um, oh, goodness, I keep losing my train of thought. <laughs> no, that's fine. Well, I, I guess, you know, maybe to follow up, not to derail you even more, but is this somewhat where he would follow, let scripture interpret scripture with this context thing. You can't faithfully preach in a, even an analytical sense of a particular text without that the general law gospel fundamental doctrine kind of yeah, truth. It, so, sorry, there. yeah, that's exactly yeah, that's exactly where I was. That um, you need to have the context. You need to have the 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 narrow context, so the surrounding verses. You need to have the broader context, so the surrounding chapters, and then you need to have the broadest context, which includes 
the book, the surrounding books and all of scripture and all the entire system and parallelism of scripture and doctrine as well. So if you are ever preaching a sermon where uh, law and gospel is not properly divided, then people would not be satisfied with that sermon in the sense that if I were to make a statement that said, you can fulfill the law sufficiently in God's eyes, or if I, or if I were to communicate that implicitly to the people, by say, if I over-focus on training and righteousness or something like that uh, and neglect the cross entirely, you implicitly could lead the people to thinking that they can earn uh, be satisfactory righteousness before God's eyes with their own works. Um, and likewise, I mean, and Pieper even goes to the point in here, I think he gets this from Walter, but I've also seen it in Luther, where he says there needs to be some comfort in, in every sermon, right? So I think that you can see the beginnings of some of the, the modern usage of the law gospel dynamic in preaching. Uh, but I think more than anything for, for Pieper, law gospel was like this necessary distinction that needs to be kept rock solid in the mind of the preacher and that whenever he preaches that the he's never to preach in such a way that the people confuse law and gospel mm -hmm. so in in people's sermons for example he does not try to make every point flow in and out of the atonement necessarily but he's bringing it in all all over the place uh, or he's bringing in other forms of comfort and consolation as well. So I, I think generally speaking, that law and gospel is completely essential to uh, Pieper's understanding of homiletics. And I think sometimes I've heard, uh, I, I've heard some people talk almost disparagingly about law and gospel uh, or with kind of, you hear law gospel preaching, and there's kind of a quirky smile. And we should be, we should, I think it's important to understand that um, it's good to cri critique a misuse of law and gospel, but that law and gospel rightly divided, rightly applied uh, within the context of, uh, of preaching and of the biblical text is an absolutely nece necessary light that shines uh, in our minds so that we understand what we're saying and why we're saying it to the people. Yeah, good. And, and I think, you know, I could picture it, you know, there's that pendulum, right? Maybe the pendulum in some ways has gone to the formulaic stencil cookie cutter law gospel, very specific, which we've talked about here in the other episode. Um, but Peeper would probably provide us the, the, in the church the caution to keep it from going in the other direction, too, and saying we got to cut, cut out this kind of framework, this mindset. Um, he wouldn't be arguing for, for that at, at all, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, in no way. Oh, good. Well, I guess we can wrap up the the main part of our our discussion today. I think we got a good feel uh, for Peeper, at least a, a primer and introduction to his homiletics. Hopefully, enough to get uh, many people eager to to see it in translation. Of course, if you're fluent in German, I'm sure you can find uh, the German edition somewhere too. Uh, but finally, and this is kind of a hypothetical, of, of course, but perhaps maybe just a summary of Pieper. Mm -hmm. How would he direct Lutheran preachers today to prepare their sermons? You know, in a, a sentence, a couple sentences or so. The task that the preacher has is to interpret the biblical text and apply it to his listeners anything outside of that is not preaching and everything that a preacher does is to serve those purposes to lead the people to knowledge of an adoption of the truth and to salvation all right very clear you had that you had that very well prepared i appreciate that that was, that was a solid answer um so now we could talk a bit more about, you know, this is a, a history podcast. So we talk about maybe also the mm -hmm. process of, of history. What can you tell us about your your research method? So, and you could you can answer either in regards to your translation project, which, which is your bigger project, or uh, the article that you wrote, um, giving us the context and explaining this a bit more. My research method was quite simple. I started with a question which was, you know, what is law gospel preaching? What, how is law gospel preaching situated in the context 
uh, historical context of preaching, especially in the Lutheran church. Um, what is this whole talk about fivefold use? What are these people? So it started with that question of relation, fivefold use or law gospel, or are we misunderstanding what's going on here? And that question was formed out of my reading from secondary literature and from my practice of homiletics. So it had those two, those two bases. In the process of reading, then I heard first uh, Dr. Kuntz uh, talk about Reinhold Pieper and his homiletics textbook. And I had German and I wanted to translate something. And I thought, well, let's go for it. Uh, so I just started, uh, started translating and as I was, and I didn't even necessarily have the goal of writing this paper uh, on on this point, but as I was uh, as I was translating, I just saw so many like just gems in in this textbook that addressed this uh, addressed this question. And so I would just take notes as I was reading through the primary source then, and how it related to the relationship of those secondary sources and the question. That was kind of the next step in the conversation and how, how it answered that question. Uh, and then, uh, my, that was, then that was my second step. And then my third step was simply to uh, synthesize my resources and, and findings uh, into an answer to that question and formulate it and elaborate it uh, out into an essay. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it, definitely. This is a prime example of being able to build on secondary research that's already out there, but finding your own particular uh, area where you can just kind of dig deep and kind of play in your own sandbox, so to speak, right? And, and to yeah. bring us something uh, unique, yet still very relevant. Um, uh, what about the translation process? I guess I'm curious, is, is that... Uh, that, is that pretty much straightforward for you? Um, the textbook, I'm uh, sure, is available in print and maybe even digital. Um, um, that probably yeah, wasn't it hard. I was I was able to uh, find a, a hard copy of it, but that was basically a miracle. Uh, the The other hard copy that I have uh, came from the St. Louis Library, uh, the the semin uh, Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, uh, and I'm so I'm indebted to them that they let me. Uh, they've let I've had it for over a year now. They just sent it to me. Uh, and have checked it out to me, uh, but and and this is the 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 wonders of the digital age. As many problems as it comes with, is you can just get the whole textbook in German for free online in a second. It's on archive.org. So wonderful. Uh, as far as the tra translation process goes, uh, yeah, it's it is somewhat straightforward and also utterly convoluted. <laughs> because there's so many moving parts. And I had this kind of paralysis when I first started because I thought, my goodness, uh, I had really only worked from German to German. I just been in, I was either in the German language or I was in the English language because that's how I learned it, right? I didn't learn it through English. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to figure out how to cross that bridge. And I realized I had never done that before. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. So, and I figured I'm just going to make, mis if I make mistakes systematically, this book is 474 pages long. I'm going to make like 10,000 mistakes and create so much work for myself. But I thought, you know what? You just got to start. So I got, uh, I got, to, got to work and just started translating uh, and, uh, and just taking uh, things you know, one step at a time. And then I received quite a bit of help from Dr. Ben Mays at uh, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, who gave me a lot of hints uh, and helps to develop my translation method. Uh, and then I also have some received some help and advice from CPH. And then finally, I'm working with uh, Matthew Carver, who's a member of the Missouri Senate uh, and is just a, a, a professional at, at translating. And he has been just of invaluable help to me in, uh, in bringing the translation to the next level. Yeah, fascinating. Well, I, I hope that you continue to to uh, continue ahead, it seems like you've you got a little bit left uh, of work, but uh, it's well well worth it, the project. So I hope this gives you more encouragement to to keep at it as best you can. So well, I guess thank I, you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I will. And I'm not saying this just to plug it for you, but I, I'll definitely uh, get a like a copy as soon as that is available for for purchase. So wonderful. Um, and we might even give an update here if if people 
tell me, I get feedback, if people are interested, I'll, I'll definitely make it a little announcement uh, for that. We want to encourage and support ongoing Lutheran historical research uh, through the podcast as, as best we can. So I guess my last question then just to wrap it up, and you know, this is, you know, we have other people who might be looking for a project or may find areas uh, they can connect with your topic. Do you think there are more areas of potential research on either narrowly Pieper and his dogmatics or the history of Lutheran preaching uh, even in a broader sense. Yeah, I, I cannot express how much work needs to be done. I heard uh, there's another homiletician who recently received his PhD in Christian preaching from Southern Seminary, uh, Josh, uh, Dr. Josh Cook, um, again, a Missouri Senate pastor. And he put it this way, you know, if we had 30 homileticians working full time, we would not be able to exhaust it. Uh, there's just a, a very rich heritage, uh, it, it, even within just the, the German mm -hmm. uh, German uh, history of, of preaching, uh, teaching on preaching, and of, and of the task of preaching. So yes, I mean, I, I've just kind of seen more and more homileticians popping up, but we need more, right? We need more people focused on this because this is the living voice of the Word of God today. And it's, uh, I couldn't emphasize enough how necessary it is. Uh, there are certain men, like I've mentioned them before, Hufel, Rodefent, Schott, Harms, uh, and many others who wrote textbooks. They had all sorts of things to, uh, to add to the conversation. And Pieper only took what he wanted out of them. And he couldn't include the whole thing. And, you know, why did Pieper choose what he chose, right? What, how did homiletics evolve from Rombach in the, 1700s to uh, Walther in the 1800s, and then to Pieper in the 20th century. N we don't know how that evolved, mm -hmm. right? And that work seriously needs to be done because in the end, and this is the goal, and we mentioned this earlier just with the task of preaching uh, or, or the task of uh, studying history is that you, you dig up the treasures out of the past and bring them to the present, right? Uh, I'm going to paraphrase something Jesus said. He said something like the writer of the kingdom of God is someone who brings out of his, uh, out of his treasures what is old and what is new, right? Uh, that's a, <laughs> a, bit, a bit of a loose paraphrase, uh, but mm -hmm. I think that that's the ultimate goal, and this is what we need. We need somebody or a group of somebodies to synthesize classical rhetoric, the biblical rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric of the ancient church, the rhetoric of historical, historical rhetoric of Lutheranism. We need people to take those, synthesize them with the new homiletic that's come up over the past uh, 50 years uh, and take all the good and get rid of the dross and produce some kind of product, but like a, a preaching textbook for 21st century Lutheranism in America. And there, no one person could do that. So mm -hmm. if anybody's interested, like, please, we need help. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what more can I say? But yeah, amen to that, right? That's, that's a very valuable project. And um, it shows that history isn't done just for history's sake, but it always comes um, into the, the present and future service of, of the church. Well, I, I just want to say thank you, um, Pastor Isaac Johnson, mm -hmm. for not only uh, coming on this podcast today and uh, and your patience with uh, getting that all set up and, and following through with that, I appreciate that, but also for, like I said already, your, your work that you have been doing and are continuing to do. Thank you so much, Benjamin. I appreciate that you had me on today. Uh, absolutely. And now uh, to our listeners, just a few closing remarks. If some of you have asked if there's a way to support the show, and I would say the best way to do that is to share the show, uh, tell people about episodes. Maybe you found this episode fascinating and you can think of one or two other people who would also like it. Uh, you could share the show through social media. Uh, we're on Facebook. I don't check Facebook too much, uh, but we do have a Facebook page there. Um, and of course, we have a website at Buzzsprout. Dot com. Um, it's tlhp.buzzprout.com, the Lutheran History Podcast. Um, if you'd like to go a step further and support the show financially, I do have a Patreon a page, a Patreon account. You can find that on Facebook or just go to that website. Um, once you get there, you can look at several different support tiers. And for fun, I had each tier named after um, different historical Lutheran figures. Uh, the lowest level of support is just at $3 a month. At higher levels, you get um, unlocked 
uh, features. So just be aware that uh, maybe you see a certain feature being mentioned. Um, they do come uh, with tiers just to make it a little interesting uh, for those who support. Uh, and in that uh, line of thinking, I'd like to thank our most recent Patreon supporter or patron, uh, Steve Zank. Uh, Steve just finished his coursework phase at uh, Concordia, uh, where I had a class with him on interpretations of the Reformation, as well as Lutheran's uh, Luther's Doctrine of Justification. So two very good history-laced courses I got to enjoy with Steve. And Steve is now supporting the show. Uh, and it turns out he actually has his own podcast, and he did not uh, solicit any endorsement or recommendation, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Steve has his own podcast called Theology in Motion. You can find it uh, where you can find my podcast as well on Spotify and other locations. So thank you, Steve, for your support and blessings on your podcast as well. So that is all for today. We look forward to bringing you more Lutheran history next month.